Today, we're beginning a new five-part series called Dealing with Offense. Dealing with Offense. And um, we're glad to look at this subject because it's an important subject to look at every so often. And it's always best to look at dealing with offense when there's no major offenses taking place in the church, if you know what I mean. Otherwise, people might think you're targeting or, or looking at some situation that's taking place. But dealing, offense is very, dealing with offense is very, very important, especially in the church, because um, undealt with offenses cause more harm in the church than probably anything else. Church splits, people leaving uh, the church, others even leaving the faith because of these things. Knowing what offense is and how to deal with it is very, very important for us all. Um, the devil loves to use offense for his work. In fact, one of the books that we recommend to you uh, to read during this period of dealing with offense series is the book by John Bevere called The Bait of Satan that goes into how the devil uses offense um, to capture, chill, uh, capture Christians and um, uh, break up the kingdom of God. Today, my title is A World of Offense. It's more of an introduction to the subject of offense and how it works. Uh, in later uh, sermons, we'll be looking at what to do when you're offended and how not to give offense and how to bring reconciliation. But today is more of a sort of a, an awareness because we find that today in the Western world, especially, we are living in a world of offense. Not just in the church, outside the church. Everybody seems to be offended about something. I'm f offended is one of the major subjects in the daily news. Perhaps there's never been a generation more concerned about offense. From boycotts on speakers that have different views than some students who are offended by their views, to career-ending cancel culture, one of the most dangerous um, apps that you can um, have today is Twitter. And careers have been ended by just a, a couple of sentences on Twitter as people have become offended, the offense has gone viral, the person has become cancelled, even their apology uh, is not accepted, uh, it, it, that uh, justice requires by those offended that their lives be ruined. The offense culture that we're living in today, and it is an offense culture, goes beyond just offending feelings. I don't like what you say. I don't like that your opinion is different to me. I feel hurt by what you've said. The offense culture goes beyond just feeling hurt or offended or displeased. There is a moral outrage today that is behind much offense, a moral outrage. And that outrage doesn't just say, I'm offended and what you've said has offended me. It wants something to happen for you to change. It wants you to repent. It wants you to, pay, to do penance. It wants you even to bring restitution in some way to pay back the offense in which you've given various people. Certain politically correct values are being elevated as the standard to which all people in society must conform. And the great high priests of cancel culture and offense culture today in the West, the great high priests or the media presenters, the film stars and pop stars, the politicians, those that write newspapers, they're the great high priests that have self-appointed themselves to determine what is offensive and what isn't, who has offended and who hasn't, and the price that the person who has offended or, 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 or perhaps just been perceived to offended must pay. And the price that is expected to pay for offense today is even being increasingly entrenched 
in legal, legal situations. The market of ideas in the Western world is, is being tried to be shut down by modern-day Phariseeism. Modern-day Phariseeism. We see this in the religious world, not just the Western world. Blasphemy laws in places like Pakistan and the Middle East mean that you do not have freedom to speak freely. And anything that is taken as an insult or an offense to a certain religion could cost you not only your freedom, but your life. In the Western world, we find that there are many occasions for offending current philosophy and current views. For exam example, sexual practice, sexual identity and gender. Right now, that is one of the hottest topics that there are. And anybody that deviates from the self-appointed high priests who determine what is acceptable sexually in identity and gender, anybody that, 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 um, that does not hold their views and champion and celebrate their views. It's not enough just to keep quiet. Today you have to celebrate views of sexual identity and, and, and gender. And if you don't, then people are offended and uh, you are expected to pay a price. One of the most offensive words that I could say uh, in the Western world today, or offensive phrases I could say in the Western world today, is, is not even only Jesus saves. To say only Jesus saves, most people just shrug that off. They're not even interested in it. But you would certainly get somebody's attention if I simply said this, which is simple and true. You are your body. A simple phrase. You are your body. Your identity is linked to your body, male or female. Saying that is one of the most offensive words that I could say uh, in the media world today. In the media world today. Offense. Now, that's speaking a bit about the world of offense that we live in. But offense is also something that is personal to us all, both Christians and non-Christians. If I can read from Luke chapter 7, verse 1 to 4, Jesus says offenses are going to come. He says to his disciples in, in, in Luke 7, 1 to 4, It is impossible that no offenses should come, but woe to him through whom they do come. It would be better for him if a millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea than that he should offend one of these little ones. Take heed to yourself. If your brother sins against you, offends you, rebuke him. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you saying, I repent, you shall forgive him. We're going to look at not only how to deal with things when we are offended as a Christian, Later on in the series, we're going to look at how to deal with things when we have offended somebody else and how, how to be more aware not to give offense where giving offense is not necessary. And here Jesus is speaking about a heart that can deal with offenses. And a heart that can deal and properly process offenses is a heart of forgiveness. In fact, he says, if your brother... Uh, sins against you, try and reconcile about it. But if he sins against you seven times, keep forgiving him. Many of us would think that somebody was taking advantage of us if we had to forgive them of the same offense seven times in a day. In fact, the next verse, the disciples say to Jesus, give us more faith. In other words, how can we have faith in God to forgive people like you have just said seven times a day? But what Jesus is saying here is the orientation and attitude of a heart. There's a heart that's here that even though offended, the heart was offended, somebody has sinned against this heart, but this heart had an openness. This heart was looking for reconciliation. The heart 
never became ensnared or trapped or closed off from this person, but was always open, seven times it says, looking for some sort of reconciliation, looking for forgiveness, looking to see this matter dealt with. This person was not closed, closed off. You know when offense occurs, I mean, we use the word offense, but, you know, what does it really mean? If you say you're offended, what do you mean? Do you mean you feel bad about what somebody has said? Or, or, or and why is what somebody has said or done made you feel offended? We talk about being offended, but when you sit down to, like, say, well, what is offense? It's very hard to grasp because it's sort of something negative. We don't like what's been said. We're offended. But the sort of things that happen when somebody is offended, maybe you can uh, uh, notice these and say, ah, yeah, that's that's when when we're offended. Um, You feel that you've been wronged. Somebody has wronged you, either actually or perceived. You feel that somebody has wronged you or disrespected you, not given you proper respect, Perhaps somebody's dismissed you and ignored you, and you're feeling hurt. Or maybe you feel betrayed by somebody you trusted, and you're offended. Or someone let you down, and you're offended. Or you're disappointed by someone. Or you've been taken advantage of, overlooked perhaps, uh, scorned, made fun of or mocked, and you feel offended. Perhaps somebody's gossiped about you, and you've just found out what they've been saying behind your back. How do you feel? You feel offended. Um, Somebody insults you. Uh, Someone envies you. And the consequences of these feelings are, are very powerful in relationships. Because if we pick up a fence and don't know what to do with it uh, in our hearts, if we've been hurt by somebody for one of these things that I've mentioned, remember the phrase, and it's really true, that hurt people hurt people. Hurt people hurt people. So without dealing with offense in a Christian manner, we will find that when someone hurts us, that without the Holy Spirit intervening, or us going the Christ way, the chances are we may hit back, we may hurt back. Offended people that don't deal with the offenses that come, and we will all feel offended at times, Jesus says that, it's what we do with how we feel we've been treated that that matters. But offended people who don't deal with offense, out of that offense can can come such fruit as anger, outrage, resentment, strife, insults, division, separation, broken relationships, backsliding. In fact, when you look at the works of the flesh in Galatians 5, often when people look at the works of the flesh, the opposite to the fruits of the Spirit, the works of the flesh, um, people often talk about the sexual aspects of the works of the flesh. But they ignore that there's a whole section there on divisions, on siding against one another, on anger and slander and all kinds of offenses that haven't been dealt with that fester in the community and cause there to be sometimes devastating results and broken relationships. In the next verse, Romans 14, verse 13, Romans 14, verse 13, I've used the amplified version, and it says this, then let us no more criticize and blame and pass judgment on one another, but rather decide and endeavor never to put a stumbling block or an obstacle or a hindrance in the way of a brother. And as I'll come to this in a few moments, the word stumbling block means offense. So let us no more criticize. Let us not blame. Let us not pass judgment. These are exactly the things that happen when somebody or some group is offended. They criticize, they blame, they judge. 
And what Paul is saying is, don't do this. And uh, don't put a block or an obstacle in, in front of someone else that will hinder them. Now, when we talk about types of um, offenses, I'd like to go to um, the slide on some areas of offenses. So we'll skip a slide and go to it. Here, here again, it's just to give you a panorama view of the type of issues we're talking about when we're talking about being of offended. Some areas of offense, and I've given four areas of offense where people may be offended. Four areas of offense. That's it. Thank you. And maybe you can identify with some of these. The first area of offense is what you might call sensitivity expectations. Sensitivity expectations. This is when someone doesn't meet your expectations of how they should treat you or how that they should speak to you. Uh, you might use the phrase, for example, I didn't expect to hear this from my best friend. And some of the greatest offenses that are held and cause destruction are often found in the family, aren't they? Found in the family. So in families, sometimes terrible offenses can take place. And family members can be estranged from one another for years because of strong offense. They say that at Christmas time, um, as much as many families are looking forward to getting together at Christmas time, that there's many people that dread Christmas time because that was the last time that they saw their uncle or their cousin or whoever it was in the family that they're offended with, that they don't talk to anymore. And often at the Christmas times, the same wounds that have been around for years are opened again. Arguments start. I often say that in some cultures, um, you're just as likely uh, to see a fight between family members at a wedding. And I, I know some cultures, I won't mention them, of friends of mine, where weddings, uh, and especially at the reception afterwards, are well known for fighting between family members that haven't seen each other. I mean, physical fighting between family members that haven't seen each other for a long time and have held this anger and resentment about something they did or something they didn't do, something they said, or something they didn't say. These sensitivity expectations are when people that you think should know better have let you down. You know, when someone you don't know or you don't care about lets you down or perhaps insults you in the street, it's not pleasant, but the chances are, unless you're very sensitive, you won't carry that with you for weeks and months. But when someone who is a close family member that you expect more of if you feel they've offended you, let you down, um, uh, not honored you, uh, if, if, uh, uh, one of the biggest causes of offense, of course, is when someone dies, leaves the will, and people start fighting over who gets what, and people become offended by what they were left or what they weren't left or what one brother wants and the other sister wants and all, all these things. And so offense can often happen in close relationships. But not just in families, sensitivity expectations can also take place with people in your life that you have great honor and respect for. So it could be a teacher. It could be uh, a hero in the media who lets you down. It could be um, somebody you put on a pedestal in the workplace. Um, it could be a pastor. Uh, one of the uh, difficulties about being a pastor or a church leader, is sometimes people have such high expectations of the position, the man of God or the woman of God, that um, if they perceive that in some way the pastor has ignored them or hasn't spoken to them uh, with the right honor or kindness, then offense can come very quickly. And it's because they hold that 
man or woman in high esteem. So what they say or don't say, do or don't do, has an amplified effect on them because this is the man or woman of God, as, as they might say. We're all men and women of God, but you know, you know where I'm coming from. So to be a pastor or someone like that, a church leader, you're putting yourself in a position where you're more likely to offend people just because of people's expectations of you, whether those expectations are right or wrong, fair or unfair. So that's sensitivity expectations. And of course, in church uh, and community and the church family, as we get to know one another, we have high expectations of one another. You know, I can't believe that she said that or he did that, and they call themselves a Christian. You ever heard of that? And they call themselves a Christian. In other words, what you're saying is, I'm offended, and you might rightly be offended, but you're offended because someone who you had a higher expectation of as a Christian has in some way let you down. If it was a non-Christian, you might say, I could have expected it. But a Christian, and the verse that reminds me of this, which um, is the next slide, is Psalm 55, verse 12. What I'm trying to do is just set the scene for you today because Everybody seems to be talking about offense and who's offended in the media and everything, but sometimes we don't sit back to think, do you know what? What is all this about? And how do we get offended? And how will we, and we'll look during this series, deal with offense, whether we've received offense or given offense? But here in this sensitivity expectations of having expectations of people close to you or or, or high up in your esteem that have let you down, read this in Psalm 55, 12. If an enemy were insulting me, I could endure it. If a foe was rising against me, I could hide. But it's you, a man like myself, my companion, my close friend, with whom I once enjoyed sweet fellowship, at the house of God, as we walked about among the worshippers. Can you see here the, 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 the offense that has been taken, the hurt that's taken place? If it was my enemy, I could have taken it. But because you were so close to me and meant so much to me and I held you in such high esteem and we worked together in the, in the house of the Lord, it's far more difficult for me to deal with the offense and the feelings I'm carrying um, uh, against, against you. So that's the first one, sensitivity expectations. We have certain expect expectations of people and they let us down. We become offended. The second one, if we can go back to that side, is give and take expectations. Give and take expectations. And this is based on the fact that um, when we give, we expect there to be uh, some appreciation of what we're giving or perhaps something reciprocal, something given back. You know, you might hear the phrase, I stopped sending her birthday wishes when she forgot my birthday four years in a row. In a, in a row. In other words, you send someone a, a birthday card or a birthday gift and you don't get one back for your birthday. Maybe you think, well, they, they just forgot it this year. Then you do it again next year, next year, fourth year, you're like, well, I'm not going to do it anymore. Why? Uh, because what I have given to them and my esteem for them has not been reciprocated, and I'm offended by that. These are give and take uh, expectations. Sometimes it's, it's doing something for someone and not being acknowledged and not even thanked. One of the greatest word, words in the church should be thank you. One of the greatest phrases should be I appreciate what you've done. It's very difficult when somebody is, is serving the Lord and feels, rightly or wrongly, that they're not being appreciated. All I wanted was a thank you. All I wanted was an acknowledgement of what I'd been doing for all of these years. I didn't do it to get an acknowledgement, but I thought I might at least get a thank you. And I'm offended by that. You're offended. You're carrying it. Remember, um, you can choose what you do with offense, but when offense comes, 
you have to deal with it. So when you get offended, it's not that you're immediately sinful. It's just something has happened, and you think, what am I going to do with this? I, I, feel, um, I feel that I'm overlooked. Somebody has overlooked all the hard work you've done. Uh, your boss doesn't realize you've done all the work and didn't give you any credit to his boss. And that, that offends you because you did all the work, or you're passed over in promotion. I've done all of this, and I didn't even get the promotion. I'm offended, offended by that. Remember, when you receive offense, it's not a sin. It's what you then do, do with it that matters. So that's give and take. Thirdly, fairness expectations. It's not fair. It's not fair. This is a simple human desire to be treated fairly and equally. It's not fair. I've been treated badly um, or I've been singled out. It's not fair. Have you ever been in a situation where you just thought, this is just isn't fair? This isn't fair the way I've been treated. This isn't fair what's happened to me. It, it's wrong. Well, you feel offended by that. You feel offended by that. Or you may blame others. Sometimes we blame others for what we've not achieved. Or we blame others thinking that they, they had the ability to give us what we wanted, but they didn't. They had ability to open the door of opportunity that we wanted, but they didn't. And so it's like, if it wasn't for this person, I could have done this. If it wasn't for that person not valuing my gifts and giving me an opportunity, I could have done the other. And so we, we're offended because we feel that people may be blocked or didn't give us the opportunities that we want. It's not fair that can bring an offense. And then finally, just to give you this panorama of different areas, I would say the fourth one is ridicule of something important to us. So we've been speaking about those that are very important to us, give it, um, expect, sensitivity expectations, those that we have given so much, I give, I give, where's the take, where's the appreciation? We've spoken about fairness, it's just not fair. And finally, um, ridicule of something important to us. Now, this could be a ridicule of our nation, or our ethnic background, or our culture, or our politics. It could be a ridicule of our religion. Someone ridicules uh, someone's religion. And that, and, and that is really important to us. And when you ridicule something that's important to me, my politics, my religion, um, my nationality... I'm offended by that. That's really hurt me because it's disrespectful and these things mean a lot to me. And for you to dismiss them, make fun of them, well, that offends me because these things should, among other things, at least be respected. I hope in that short introduction you've got this feel of what we're talking about in offense because if we don't know the parameters of offense or what offense is like, then sometimes we don't even know that we're offended and we don't know how to deal with it. Now, in the next scripture I have, in Proverbs 18, verse 19, it shows you what happens when we get into offense and don't properly deal with it. And we'll be unpackaging this through the next four Sundays. Proverbs 18, verse 19. A brother offended is more unyielding than a strong city, and quarreling is like the bars of a castle. Can you see immediately we have this um, sensitivity uh, uh, offense? It's a brother. It's someone close to us. That makes it even uh, worse. But it's more unyielding than a strong city, and quarreling is like the bars of a castle. The, the picture here is someone that's entrapped in prison, who's offended. Now, the person is offended. Whether the offense is justified or not, if you understand, or just perceived, is beside the point. The person themselves is in a prison and is unyielding, unyielding. One of the real dangers of offense is when we get offended and we harden ourselves. We're not going to be like the person Jesus said we should be who had a heart that was open enough and remain open enough seven times in a day. 
That heart was looking for reconciliation, looking for peace, despite the fact that they'd been offended again and again and again. That heart was looking for peace, for reconciliation, for forgiveness. It was the orientation of the heart. But here's somebody that doesn't have that orientation anymore. They've, um, they're in prison. And unfortunately, when you're in the prison of offense, the lock is on the inside. You've not been locked in from the outside. When you're caught in strong offense, you have locked yourself in. And the only way that you can step out of the negative consequences of a continued offense is to unlock that door, that prison door, by the help of the Lord and with forgiveness and an open heart and a trust that God is in control of your life, not the person who offended, offended you. Now, walls. A brother is more unyielding than a strong city. Walls to keep people out. Walls. Sometimes we've been hurt, and so we build walls of offense. You know, it says, uh, do unto others as you would have them do unto you, yeah? But when you're offended, it becomes this, do unto others before they do it to you. So you become protective, you shield yourself, you build thicker and thicker walls because you've been hurt by offense. You're not looking for reconciliation or healing, but you just want to protect yourself from any more hurt. And some people are more easily offended than others. But then again, then again, before we criticize them, some people have gone through a lot more hurt than others. And when some people have gone through a lot more hurt from others, if they don't know the healing touch of Jesus and put the scriptures into, uh, into action in word and deed and heart, then people that are hurt will often build up very strong walls. They're very, very sensitive to even perceived offenses. But at the same time, they have these very strong walls that keep people out. Over the years, I've known people who were who uh, lovely Christians in many respects, but really super sensitive about everything. I mean, a number of people over the years... Um, would come to me and they would say, uh, uh, what you said in the sermon, you were having a go at me, weren't you? Or why did you keep looking at me in the sermon? And I'm saying, I wasn't looking at you in the sermon. I'm preaching to a thousand people at Kensington Temple. (laughs) You know, do you think I'm just going to gear my sermon to have a go at you? Yes, I do. Well, what's that? That's a sad situation, isn't it? Because someone's so sensitive sensitive that they think anything negative from the platform must be the pastor whom they hold in in esteem picking on them. What is the history of a person like that? That they would come to a, a really difficult situation. And with some of those people, it's just taken time of affirming them. And then finally they come to the place where they, they, well, they always have these issues, but they come to the place where they know, well, perhaps maybe... Maybe you weren't, and you've sort of shown me love. Because when when someone gets offended at you, it's so easy to hit back. You were pointing at me in the sermon, and everything you said negatively was all about me and only me. How dare you say that? Do you think you're the only person in the congregation? What have I done? I've just reinforced the fact that what they believe and what they're offended. How is that going to bring them out of the um, trap of offense? Finally... I want to show you the Bible's definition of offense, which encompasses many of the things I've already said, but let's go right to to what the the Bible says, or the New Testament word for offense is. Well, the New Testament word for offense is scandalon. Scandalon. Remember, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. So when we want to find out what a word means in the New Testament, sometimes it's good to go back to the Greek word and find out what that means, because sometimes the Greek word can mean a lot more than, say, the English word. That's why we do it. 
and scandalon, where we get the word scandal from, scandal from, scandalon, this actually is referring to a trigger of a trap, a trap stick, a trap, a snare. So you think of trappers that are setting traps for beavers or wild animals or rabbits or something like that. And they, they set a trap and they put bait in this. I'm not watching this wildlife program um, uh, on, up in Alaska, and uh, they live on this um, island, and so uh, they live off the land, and one of them's a trapper, and you watch him go out, and he's trying to trap beavers, and he puts the trap in the right place, and he puts the right bait there, and then he leaves it there, the trap, and it's always got a trigger, a trigger. And then what comes in, the beaver comes along, and uh, takes the bait, or whatever animal it might be, the trap closes, and the uh, animal is caught. Well, this, this is the New Testament word for an offense. And that's why John Bevere, in his excellent book, Offense, the Bait of Satan, is talking about how the enemy wants to trap us in offense. That's one of his greatest schemes, to get somebody trapped in a fence so that they can't move forward. Or, like we read earlier, to put them in a prison of their own making with the lock on the inside. So this is a trap offense. It's also a stumbling block or an impediment placed in the way causing someone to stumble or fall. And uh, so a stumbling block, you know, it's when, something, when you put something out and somebody trips over it. Who put, you know, you can imagine a parent, who left their shoes out and they, they tripped over it? When I was a young boy, we used to play army a lot in the Yorkshire Dales. And uh, what we used to do is we used to, we used to take like, um, I don't know what it was, like plastic wire that was invisible. And we used to like tie it to trees and posts and things like that. And then we'd like wait for people and we'd all start chasing one another and then someone would trip over, you know, go face down into the mud and we'd all think it was brilliant because we, we tripped them up. Don't recommend that, but the junior church isn't here today. They're out, so they didn't pick up anything bad. But it's this, it's this tripping up of people. And so offense can trip people up. You're going well, everything's good with you and the Lord, everything's good with you and the people. And someone just says something that gets you. Whether they meant it or not, it gets you. And it's festering there. And it's like, how, why would they say that to me? Why would they, don't they know, why would they, that's a bit rude, that's a bit of an insult, that's a bit unthoughtful. Uh, why would so, someone in my family say that? Why would my pastor say that, you know, the high expectations? Or after everything I've done, the person didn't even say thank you, and I did the whole party for them, or, or you know, or that's just not fair. Why would, why would this happen? Why, 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 why wasn't I given the trip on the business thing? These things, they're just little, little things, and they trip you up. You're doing all right, but you tripped up, and you haven't just tripped and stumbled, but you've tripped and you've fallen down. And the question is, how much has this offense tripped you up, and when will you get back up again? There's people in this room that in various relationships, in various, rela one relationship or various, there's people in this room, you've been tripped up in a various relationship or friendship or work colleague, whatever it is, you've been tripped up and, and, and as regard as that situation is, you're still flat on your face. There's people in this room, and I'm not being a prophet, we're just, it's just being called human beings in a room. It's, it's not prophecy. It's just, going to be true. People in this room, and in some area, you're, you're still locked in a prison, in some sort of relationship or situation with a person or something that's happened, you're still, offend, you're still offended. And so this trips up. Jesus is a stumbling block. The gospel is an offense. And next week, we're going to be looking at the gospel, the offense of the gospel. So not everything is negative that's an offense in the sense, but the gospel is offense. The gospel can trip people up as well as save people. It depends how you take it. The gospel, the true gospel, can be extremely offensive, and some churches seek to get as rid of anything that might be offensive to an unbelieving culture. 
Don't even talk about anything that's offensive. If you're asked about something that might offend somebody in British society, don't even talk about it. Even if the Bible's clear about it, don't talk about it. Get rid of the offense of the Bible and hope that you can have a non-offensive Christianity that will save and disciple people. Impossible. Impossible. Because Jesus' message challenges everybody everywhere, and even we as Christians that are here today, Jesus' Jesus's challenge should offend us. That's a hard saying, Lord. There's plenty of things in the Bible that I read that offend my heart, even though I believe they're real. Do you understand what I'm saying? God, that's difficult, Lord. I'm going to have to work that through. Well, that's positive. That's good. Because it means I'm interacting with a holy God as a sinful Christian who's growing in grace and coming across another thing that could stumble me. And I'm going to believe God and study and believe God with it and just say, I believe, you say it, I believe it. And then later on, often you find out, ah, now I understand why you said that, Lord. At the time it stumbled me, but I've learned that anything you say that stumbles me, give it time, and then I'll come to the place where I go, now I've got it. That used to stumble me. That used to trip me up, what the Bible taught about this or the other. But now I haven't ignored it, but I have worked it through. And I accepted it even before I understood it. And I've learned to accept what the Word of God says, even if I don't understand it, because I have found that if you study long enough, speak to the right person, you will get to understand it in your heart. And it won't just be believing by faith. Well, as we close today, I've sort of like set the scene, stirred the pot. But even being aware of issues of offense can be a very uh, good step in dealing with them. Because I've said some people don't even know that they're offended. This is one of the biggest difficulties and one of the biggest traps of offense. You're offended, but you don't see the offense. You don't see it in, in yourself. You, 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 see the, you see the obstacles in everybody else's eyes, but there's no speck in your eye, but, but, but there is. And, think, and, and not, not, not being open enough to say, am I offended? Because people say this, I, I've, I've learned this trick in the Christian church that people use. When, when you're dealing with an issue of relationship and they say, well, I'm sorry I offended you. In other words, I'm offended. No, I, no, not say, I'm sorry that you're offended. In other words, I'm the problem. I'm offended. What they said or did was offensive, but they're sorry that I'm offended because offense is a sin. I'm offended. So that what they did hurt me, but I'm the one now who's got to deal with it. I'm, I, the person hits me, offends me twice, says something rude, and then I say, look, I'm really not happy about it. Well, I'm sorry if I offended you. Oh, now I've got to deal with offense. So we have to understand that knowing that you're offended isn't sinful. It's saying, hey, I'm hurt by this. I'm offended by this. Why? Hopefully this sermon will help you understand why you're offended and what area it is. Think, well, what am I going to do about this? How am I going to act? How am I going to deal with this? Some people are locked in a uh, dungeon or a prison, or some people, when they're offended, they hit back. They want justice, what they call justice. You don't want justice, my friends. You want grace. They want, they want, they want retribution. They call the elders. I want this person sorted out. This is their attitude. Uh, you can call the elders at time, but if you do call the elders, it's out of a heart for reconciliation. It's all about where your heart is, is coming. So some people fight back, and the results of offense is more destruction and hurt. Other people don't fight back. They just walk away. They just walk away. You know, when people leave churches, uh, some move different cities, all of that's fine, you know. But very often, I find that when people leave churches, often, often, for no apparent reason, like I'm moving nation, often there's a root of offense there. Oh, the Lord is just leading me to another church. Really? 
Yeah, yeah, I just want to be in my area. I just want to do, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, maybe that's true. Maybe that's true. And maybe it's not. Maybe something has offended you in the current congregation or the past. Something's offended you. You're not happy about. And instead of dealing with it, you find it far easier just to walk away. And I know that in me, I'm that sort of person. Are you a fighter or a runner when it comes to offense? Some of you are right. You offended me. I'm going to offend you back. I'm going to, and, and then the, the whole thing explodes. You know what I'm saying? Others of us like, don't say a word. Don't even, some cultures, they never let you know that they're offended. They can stand there and you offend them. You say something and they just don't let you know. You never know. But at that moment, you have deeply hurt them and offended them. And they walk away. And they think, right, what I'm going to do? And they think, well, I'm not going to cause a fuss. I'll just go somewhere else. Yeah, you're a fighter or a runner. Uh, by nature, I'm a runner. <laughs> Some of you are by nature a fighter. But you just got to know, because it's wrong to run and it's wrong to fight. So what do we do about it? Well, that's what we're looking at in this series, and many of you already know what to do, and the first thing to do is to open your heart. If the father who was offended at our sin so badly that it took Jesus' death on a cross to pay for the offense, the father who loves us, never forget, the most offended person in the universe is the father. Oh, the offense of sin. How we have offended him. But what did he do? His love overcame the offense and he sent his only son who paid a terrible, horrible price on the cross because God was so offended so that we wouldn't have to pay the price. Instead, we could receive the gift of the Abba Father on this love, on this Father's Day. Abba Father. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for us on the cross. Thank you, Lord Jesus, that you removed the right and terrible offense of sinful human beings against their own creator. Thank you, you paid the price for our offense. And thank you for those that receive your gift. The offense has been removed and God's love is upon us and we can call him Abba, Father. Help us as we are dealing with issues of offense now and in the future to, um, to know that we who have been forgiven much should also be generous and open in our forgiveness of others, which is the beginning of dealing with offense. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.